Hello and welcome. Cancer Council New South Wales would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, both past and present, on the lands on which we live and work. Tonight's webinar examines the question, what are the legal issues I might face in the workplace? The panel will discuss legal and HR issues in the workplace in addition to information and strategies which will be presented regarding how to cope with these challenges. Before we get started, I'd like to go through some housekeeping to make this event as seamless and interactive as possible. Firstly, if you wish to ask either the panel or myself a question throughout the webinar, please use the text chat facility which is located in the bottom left corner of your screen. You can also use this feature to post comments and ask technical questions or to just chat and share information between each other. So don't be distracted by the chat box. Um, if you do feel that you are and you get a little bit annoyed by it, you can always watch the recorded webinar later. So um, where am I? I'm, I'm lost now. <laughs> to protect your privacy, you will not be able to see who has logged in tonight, but in the chat box you will see a first name and the initial of the surname. And if you experience any difficulty hearing the sound throughout tonight's webinar, please feel free to listen via the telephone. Um, there's a phone number you'll see in the chat box there, the 1-800-896-323 number, and enter the passcode 41883448. So as I said, tonight's webinar um, will be recorded and anyone that registered will be sent a link um, on their email so they can view the recording later. So during the last 15 minutes of the webinar, we're going to be answering some of um, your questions. Obviously, we can't address every question, but we'll sort of address the most commonly raised subjects. And if you ask any questions during the webinar, um, we'll try and get to those as well. So if at any stage you need to speak to someone urgently, please don't hesitate to contact the Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14. The support is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So let's get started. So firstly, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have Sarah Penman. Sarah is the National Manager of Cancer Council Pro Bono Programs. Sarah White, and Sarah is an employment lawyer working for Kelly and Co Lawyers in Adelaide. And Joanne Kruger, who is a Human Resources Manager who works for Government Department in Canberra. We also have Annie Miller, um, who's our Practical Support Manager at Cancer Council, and she's monitoring the live chat in the chat box. We also have Luke, and Luke will be telling you about his story um, and the issues he's had in the workplace. So let's get started. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Jill. So there are a range of legal and HR issues which arise as a result of a cancer diagnosis, both for patients and for people caring for patients as well. Uh, many people might experience workplace uh, discrimination based on their cancer diagnosis or treatment. Employees may experience problems at work after telling their manager about their cancer diagnosis, but they can often be too afraid to speak up about these problems as they may fear things like losing their job, being demoted, and so therefore they don't take any action. Uh, often it can be the psychological distress that's experienced in such situations that may become overwhelming and affect the person's ability to perform their job effectively and it, and it may impact on their home life as well. Issues experienced include getting difficult, sorry, include difficulty getting time off work to attend treatment or to take someone else that you're caring for to treatment and or medical appointments, demotion, job loss and other negative repercussions at work. Raising these matters with your manager or seeking legal advice is not necessarily easy to do. Our aim in this webinar tonight is to provide you with information regarding your rights at work and strategies to help you gain some confidence to address any issues which you may be facing in the workplace. As each case is individual, the information that we're providing is general and we would suggest that you do refer to either your HR manager or an external HR professional or an employment lawyer depending on your situation. So just to get started, we're going to ask a poll question for everyone who's watching the webinar right now to see can you identify with any of these issues we've just talked about, with discrimination, psychological distress, legal obligations and HR matters. So here we go, here's the live poll now, sorry about that. Um, so if you just click obviously yes, no or thumb, would be great. Mm. 
Anyone else want to respond there? <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. So I'd now like to pass over to Luke. Um, so Luke is a teacher. He's our consumer today. He's a teacher, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his story. So Luke, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, I had had uh, uh, surgery in December of 2012 um, uh, for a skin cancer that had uh, spiraled inward towards my brain. Uh, and, and in that surgery, I had my ear canal removed and uh, I had uh, my parotid gland removed, which essentially uh, is one of two that makes saliva. So um, subsequently, I had uh, radiotherapy for several weeks. I had told my uh, employer um, what my situation was. Uh, I had my surgery on the first day of the Christmas school holidays. Um, I had my radiotherapy uh, before and after work, um, so that didn't take any of the uh, time out from my work. Uh, after my surgery, I was left with a, a palsy on one side of my face. My face uh, drooped uh, like I had had a stroke. I'm not sure if we've lost the connection there. Um, are we still there? Yep, you're on Luke. Okay, all right. Um, so I, I had uh, come back to uh, work in 2013 thinking, you know, my employer uh, may make some concessions. And, and uh, to my workload, uh, surprisingly, um, he was quite a young man in his uh, 30s. And, um, he said to me uh, that uh, in my workplace, you were either fit for work or you weren't. And there weren't uh, many um, modifications of my work that was possible. I, I taught mainly uh, year 11 and 12. Um, he was also nice enough to, to uh, uh, not only not reduce my workload, but actually increase it. So um, in my school, I had previously taught uh, English to U12, which involved a uh, fair workload um, and legal studies. And now I was faced with teaching two other senior subjects as well, <laughs> neither of which I, I'd taught before. Um, and he told me I was uh, uh, reasonably uh, clever and I'd just handle it. And because, uh, and other people, another manager within my school, uh, told me that uh, he knew that chemotherapy was quite serious, but radiotherapy really wasn't uh, that big a deal. Um, so when I uh, came back to work and I initially had this uh, palsy, and, and uh, people were, you know, my colleagues were, you know, quite sympathetic. Um, it meant that uh, essentially uh, I had one eye that didn't blink. And it would dry out. And in my job, uh, you know, a lot of reading was required, and I found that quite difficult. There'd come a certain point in the day where I really, uh, you know, by the time of the, the work day was over, I just needed to take my eyes shut. I couldn't actually close it initially. Um, and uh, I, after the radiation therapy was finished, um, you know, the worst time in terms of the effects of that was probably about a month afterwards. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, you know, feelings of fatigue and, and, uh, certainly a, a general feeling of being unwell. But, um, uh, I, I managed to, uh, I didn't have any days off during my radiation treatment. But, uh, after that, I found it difficult to get tasks done within the same time frame, uh, that I had done for the several years that I'd worked. Uh, at this job because of the fatigue and also because uh, my eyes weren't working properly. I had a lot of, uh, you know, swelling after the surgery. Um, I had a, a, a temporary change in prescription for my glasses. Um, my left eye didn't shut. <laughs> I had to tape it shut. Uh, it dried out. I also had just a, a few problems with my speech because of this policy. But um, during uh, the last... A couple of years, 
Um, my employer, uh, my manager, uh, principal in the school, um, never once asked me, how are you? Um, <laughs> uh, my immediate manager in charge of the senior school, likewise, never asked me, how are you? Or, uh, gee, what's it like to have radiation therapy? Uh, does that affect you for very long afterwards? And uh, uh, he just complained when I wasn't getting things done as quickly as I used to. Um, and uh, the, the business manager uh, at one point who um, <laughs> surprised me uh, by asking me, do I really need to go and see as many doctors as I was doing? Um, uh, you know, the, the, the colleagues in my workplace were great, the kids at the school were great, and the only people that didn't kind of uh, make any effort to um, modify my work or uh, give me any concessions at all, unfortunately, were the people who mattered. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people feel that uh, when you have a, a talk with your boss, it's not really a conversation, it's not a level playing field. Uh, for most people, um, you know, you're hamstrung by, you know, the fact that, you know, most people with families, these people can turn off your income uh, like a tap. And uh, so it's, it's difficult to have a frank conversation. And, and particularly if, like me, you've never been in a situation where you've been chronically ill or, uh, you know, I was uh, having radiation in February and March and for the rest of 2013 I found I was generally not uh, feeling well um, and uh, I, as I said I was left with this palsy and, and I found it really difficult to do the job that I'd done never mind the fact that uh, my employer had actually increased my workload uh, and I was told by the media person at my workplace that uh, uh, I really, in terms of photos, didn't present a strong corporate image and it would be a good idea if I could kind of stay out of as many as possible um, because it didn't project the right corporate image. Um, prior to having uh, the surgery that I had, um, I, I was a bit worried about any sort of uh, concerns, uh, any effect on my brain or my cognitive capacity. And I had some fairly extensive testing done uh, in Melbourne, and then post radiation, you know, I, I had some some testing done for my own peace of mind, really. Uh, and and you know, my brain was apparently unaffected. It was just my energy levels and 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 my vision, um, and and to some extent my speech. And it didn't present a problem for the the kids that I taught. You know, I, I changed my approach to the, the task that I did. But I was really surprised that uh, I somehow felt, uh, I got the feeling from my employer that I was letting everyone down by this, this policy that I had wasn't getting better. Uh, and that was just a, a residual effect from the surgery. And, and, and they had done their bit by being very welcoming when I came back to work, but I had kind of let people down because I didn't get better quickly enough. And I still have that to some extent, the nerves in my face have been damaged by the surgery, um, but it has uh, improved to the extent now where I don't have a speech impediment and I can close my eye. Um, but I, you know, I and the fatigue has gone. Uh, but I was really surprised that uh, uh, you know I, I felt that increasing my workload was uh, you know, surprising to say the least. But uh, um, I, and I still don't understand. Uh, I still don't understand it really. But I, I was very naive about people's reaction to cancer uh, and, and to the treatments associated with it, and, and their willingness to express a, an authoritative opinion when they really had um, no medical background. You know, uh, things like uh, radiation treatment's not that serious, is it? It only takes 15 minutes. How could it be? It doesn't leave any mark. How could it be serious? Uh, and it's uh, an effect of the radiation of my brain stem was I lost feeling in my legs below the knees, too, which made walking interesting um, uh, because my brain stem was irradiated. I, I developed what's called an idiopathic uh, uh, neuropathy, which is uh, losing sensation in my toes and feet, and then it crept slowly up my legs. Um, and uh, 
and I was quite um, photosensitive also when I had uh, radiation treatment, but uh, that was the only concession that my, my employer made by allowing me to stay out of the sun on, on days like uh, athletic carnivals and, and uh, walkathons and so on. But where I, I just worked at, at an alternative task indoors. But uh, it's been, I, I've resigned from that job now uh, out of, uh, you know, I guess I was a bit angry and a bit disappointed and, and I felt really, uh, um, I was a person teaching two year 12 subjects uh, um, and because I wasn't meeting time frames uh, rather than, you know, a discussion and a conversation about, about it, I was just delivered ultimatums, uh, you know, by email. Uh, and they just simply had no understanding of uh, the effect. And, and uh, um, I was told uh, by one person it wasn't really my employer's problem because it wasn't an injury associated with work. Um, and uh, it was a private sector uh, school. Yeah, thanks for answering that, Luke. Yeah. Um, as we've got on the slide there, um, just briefly talking about um, you know legal action and whether or not you're planning on pursuing that whether you wanted um, to talk about the, that the legal before. action thing I you know I actually studied law when I left school um, but to be honest legal action is very frightening you know I've had a conversation with a workplace lawyer in Melbourne and lawyers charge you know four hundred dollars an hour and, and uh, regardless of it's a no win no pay uh, the litigant or the person initiating the action still has to pay disbursement and, and they can be uh, you know, very expensive and cumulatively speaking and at the moment I haven't worked since uh, the 19th of May so what's that, you know, five weeks or so. I've got a family, um, uh, my wife works part time and, and the prospect of taking legal action I'm not, uh, you know, the, my employer is very well resourced. They have lawyers on staff. Um, you know, the, the school system that I work in has, uh, it's Australia wide and they have lawyers, salaried lawyers. Uh, whereas for an individual to take legal action, firstly, you know, it's, it's, uh, while I have some sense of, uh, being wronged and, and I really feel uh, the advice that I've been given is that I have been discriminated against under the Disability Act of 2010. Um, you know, it frightens me to, to uh, ante up with uh, money at this particular time when after, you know, paying for radiotherapy treatment and I was a private patient and, um, you know, I've been to Melbourne in the last, uh, you know, uh, 15 months uh, I don't know, 50, 60 times, I guess, to see different people. Um, you know, it, it's uh, an inability to, uh, you know, it, it's not something that you would undertake uh, in, in a cavalier way. It frightens me um, in case I lose and in case I disadvantage my um, uh, family. Yeah, exactly. And it is, it is a, a very um, difficult decision to make. We might um, move on to the polling questions now, Luke. Thanks. Thanks very much for sharing your story and um, sure. you'll be staying online to help us continue on with the discussion. So with the polling question again, if people could join and you know, some of these issues that um, Luke brought up, can any of you that are online at the moment relate to these issues that he's, he's discussed? So there were a lot of different things, so here we go. It's good to get some feedback on from from everyone that's on board to um, see how on the mark we are. Do it another minute or so. Thanks, everybody. So now we'd like to um, move on. Next um, presenter, Sarah White. Sarah is um, our employment lawyer from Kelly and Co Lawyers. Hi Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to the New South Wales um, Cancer Council for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, my part of the presentation will focus on the private sector. Joanne, who's speaking after me, will focus on the public sector. Um, but 
with some of the stuff um, might overlap. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say that the types of legal issues that people affected by cancer might face in the work, workplace will usually depend on their diagnosis. Um, what I mean by that is the type of treatment um, that you're required to have um, or the individual employer and how sophisticated they are. Um, for example, if someone's treatment protocol requires them to be absent off work for two years without any opportunity to go back to work between that, um, their workplace issues are obviously going to be a lot different to someone who has periods where they need time off work but um, can return to work in some capacity um, at some point um, in the near future. Um, one thing that's also important to understand is that a lot, a lot of the time employers um, don't actually know what's right and wrong and how to manage situations like this in the workplace. Um, now, usually that's a good thing because um, there's not as many um, people faced with these sorts of issues and HR managers um, and employers aren't facing these issues regularly. Um, but a lot of the time people who do face issues in the workplace won't necessarily have the energy or as Luke mentioned um, previously, the financial um, standing to be able to challenge um, what's right or wrong in the workplace. Um, I guess that's why um, services like the Cancer Council's pro bono referral service are really good because there's certain cases that we've assisted with where the legal fees, if you were paying for them, would probably out, um, outweigh the amount of money that you might recover, but acting on a, a basis where um, providing there's no disbursements for council fees, um, that you come, can come to some kind of resolution where um, you can bring your employer accountable. Um, firstly, I just wanted to talk through the legal framework that underpins the employment relationship. An understanding of this is pretty important to know where you have legs to stand on and where you perhaps don't. Um, now, everyone that's joined, um, as I understand, comes from different states. Um, and as I said before, the framework will depend on um, your employer. Um, so for example, the industrial relations laws that underpin your employment relationship will generally, for most employers, um, be governed by the federal workplace relations laws. Unless you're employed by a state government or local council, um, generally um, those laws will apply. Now these sorts of laws that I'm talking about will govern leave entitlements, so when you can absent yourself from work, for personal or carers leave, um, dismissal and those sorts of issues. I'll go into them in more detail shortly, but I'm just going to give you an overview of the framework that exists. Um, the other thing that the industrial relations laws um, underpin is in relation to um, the minimum employment type um, entitlement. Um, employers, I guess that's the legislated minimum, um, but employers can provide for much more generous entitlements than these instruments. It's always good if you're faced with a situation to have a look at your um, legal contract, if you've got one, to see if there's any greater entitlement. To the extent that the contract um, doesn't provide for the minimum legal entitlements, the law will apply rather than the contract. Um, the other thing that can provide for generous entitlements are um, awards or enterprise agreements. These documents essentially sit side by side with the legislation and they're made pursuant to legislation. Um, and just an example, um, someone that I know um, was required to have um, about eight months off work um, from post-cancer related illnesses. Um, now these all paid leave entitlements had been exhausted. Um, obviously that would be a pretty scary situation to be in when you're faced with something where you've already gone for a period of time, this particular person had already had two years off work and then faced with another eight months of unpaid um, uh, leave would be quite 
concerning. Um, obviously, unlike Luke's employer, um, this employer actually had an enterprise agreement which specified a number of um, medical conditions which um, were covered by special paid leave entitlements. Um, so that's why it's always important to go to those instruments to see what your minimum entitlements um, may be. Now, the other sort of laws which underpin the employment relationship are discrimination laws. Now, each state has its own set of anti-discrimination laws, but there's also a Federal um, Disability Discrimination Act, which covers everyone. Um, it might seem quite complex, and there have been um, many plans to try to, um, I guess, harmonise the discrimination um, and equal opportunity laws. But I won't go into the specific details, but what's the important message to take away is that everyone is actually protected by some form of discrimination laws in the workplace. Um, the other sorts of um, legislative instruments that can be relevant are the work health and safety laws. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people um, do experience some form of bullying in the workplace. Your employer has a legal obligation to provide you with a safe working environment. Um, and obviously, a safe working environment is somewhere that's free from bullying. Um, bullying, I'll talk um, briefly about this shortly as well, but that also is covered under industrial relations laws um, for certain employees. Um, the next um, issue that I just wanted to touch on was workers' compensation. Now, this can be particularly relevant if employee, an employee suffers an injury within the meaning of the workers' um, compensation legislation that applies in the relevant state. Um, now, employers who handle um, situations poorly, perhaps like Luke's example, um, and the treatment that he suffered at work from um, management, may give rise to um, a stress claim, um, depending on the legislative framework. Um, and also, there are certain types of cancers which um, employment can cause. Um, so this overview is obviously very broad, um, but I just wanted to briefly touch on the, the different types of legislative instruments which sit on top of the employment relationship before going into the different types of claims um, that we will often see coming through. So I'm just trying to move on to my next slide. There we go. So the types of legal um, protections that are, are available um, I'll now go into in more detail. Um, the, the legal protections that are available to you will depend on a case-by-case -case basis and the certain situations employers are faced with. I've never seen um, one <laughs> um, claim come through the Cancer Council referral service that is similar to the last. Um, it will always depend on the individual circumstances um, and how the employer is um, handling the process. The first claim type of claim that I want to talk about is general protections or unfair dismissal laws. Now, general protections are still a fairly new beast um, in terms of a legal protection that's in, in, an entitlement um, for you to have in the workplace. Um, this generally provides, um, as, as it sounds, a general protection for employees um, to prevent an employer from taking adverse action for certain um, grounds. Now, particularly relevant to, um, to this um, topic would be people who are suffering a temporary illness or injury or because of a physical or mental disability. Um, so an employer it can't, um, on the face of it, take any adverse action. So it doesn't have to be a dismissal. It can be a demotion. It can be um, it can be a very wide range of um, things, um, discipline, reaction, anything like that, because of those protected attributes. Now there are certain exemptions. Um, now one one thing that obviously will depend on your cancer diagnosis, as I mentioned um, before, will depend on. Um, what's called temporary absence or illness. Um, this is defined in the legislation as three months in any 12-month period. 
So if you're under um, this three month period in any 12 month period, you are in afforded, um, I guess, protection from this. Um, otherwise, the legislation has to strike a balance between allowing employers to um, make a difficult decision to take adverse action because they might need to fill the job um, or make some kind of an arrangement for, um, for while you will be off work. Um, so that's why they sort of have that defined period. Um, now the other sort of exemptions are if it would not be, um, if there's an exemption in a state-based anti-discrimination laws or a federal anti-discrimination laws. Now um, there, there are requirements, so after you um, have passed that three months in any 12 month period, um, in some discrimination legislation um, there is a requirement um, for an employer to make reasonable adjustments. Um, so in loop situation like he was speaking about before, it might be looking at the feasibility of getting a part-time teacher into job share with him and that sort of thing. Um, so there are um, defences, I guess, to that, if you like, which would be when it would cause unjustifiable hardship to the employer. Um, but it's just something that you should be aware of is um, it's not a blanket um, exemption. Now, legal recourse um, for this, I ha I'm not going to go into unfair dismissals in any detail because I think in most situations um, general protections will be the um, avenue but very briefly unfair dismissals will be, uh, laws will be available if the employer has, um, hasn't gone through a fair process um, and doesn't have a valid reason. Um, generally that's more in relation, in relation to misconduct or performance issues but with um, with this sort of issue, it's generally a general protections claim. Um, the advantage of a general protections claim as well is that there's uncapped damages um, and the primary remedy if you have been dismissed is reinstatement with lost wages. Um, whereas there's an unfair dismissal cap of 26 weeks pay. Um, moving on to discrimination, as I said before, discrimination laws vary from state to state. Under the Disability Discrimination Act, the Federal Act, um, it prohibits direct and indirect discrimination. So the difference between those two is um, direct would be if someone is um, terminated or action was taken because of their disability. Indirect is imposing a requirement that would be more difficult for someone with a disability to um, achieve. Um, so. That may be something like a, a bonus structure, for instance, that takes into account um, absence, absences from work, work um, irrelevant and not d discounting any absence because of your um, absence for your um, a, a disability protected under the Act. Um, now, very importantly to note under this is that. A disability can include a disability that currently exists, that previously existed but no longer existed or may exist in the future. Um, now that's obviously important in terms of people going out to look for work and that sort of thing. Um, if you're um, required to disclose this to your employer, and we'll go into that when we're answering the questions a little bit later. Um, the exemptions that exist I mentioned them before, so um, when you can't perform the inherent requirements of your role, I went into um, reasonable adjustments, but an employer, after you um, have passed that three month in any 12 month period, an employer, um, if you can't perform the inherent requirements of your job, which would require looking at your job description or the nature of your work, um, may be able to take um, action which would be defendable under the Act. Um, also protected for victimisation. So if you make a complaint about how you're being treated at work um, because of a protection under the Disability Discrimination Act, then that would be an offence um, that would be committed. 
Now, legal um, recourse for this would be available through the Australian Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission if you're looking at the federal legislation or state-based um, tribunals in New South Wales. Um, you've got a specific body set up to um, manage the state-based anti-discrimination laws and all states have something similar. Now, this, if you're going down this route, it's the most common um, recourse um, would be damages um, and sometimes penalties can be imposed as well. Now, the other topic I'm going to touch on is bullying. I mentioned that before. Um, the Fair Work Commission under the Industrial Relations Laws has this new bullying jurisdiction. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is it will protect it, the types of things that can um, be protected here is to try to put measures in place um, for, stop, for things to stop bullying. So the type of order that you seek is a stop bullying order. You can't seek financial compensation, but in order to bring a claim under this jurisdiction, um, the definition of bullying is um, when a person or a group of people repeatedly behave unreasonably to a worker or a group of workers at work and the behaviour creates a risk to health and safety. The important thing there is that it creates that risk. Once you've left the workplace, um, that risk obviously won't be ongoing. So if there has been adverse action or termination, um, this sort of jurisdiction isn't really what you would be looking at. Um, but it does need to put things in place um, if you are still in the work environment. Um, employers will offer... Sorry, yep. Sarah. We, I might just have to cut you off there because yeah, we're going to be running short of time. Fine. I'm always done anyway. So we can cover the rest in the questions. In the question, yeah. So the workers' comp was the thing. So we might just skip on to you now, Joanne. Um, so... Joanne, she, as I said before, is an HR manager working in the public sector because we want to have time for some questions at the end. So um, over to you, Joanne. Thank, thank you for inviting me onto this forum. Um, I would like to just put a caveat over my presentation by saying I can only speak from the public sector point of view as that is where I currently work and have worked for many years. So within the public sector, staff are employed under specific legislations and acts, which I'm sure most of you are aware who work in that sector, such as the Australian Public Sector Act and associated regulations, and also covered by Commonwealth law, as in discrimination law and work health and safety, of course. And, this, um, and the regulations clearly set out the terms and conditions of employment. Now, noting that a health declaration must be completed on engagement of duty of when you commence work. And this needs to be updated if a medical condition changes during the course of your engagement. So all Commonwealth or state health state agencies will have some form of health declaration that must be filled out. It doesn't need to be in depth. It just needs to be short and sweet and say what the condition would be, whether it's epilepsy or cancer or whatever. You just need to put that in. So an agency head may deem it necessary if they have concerns and they must write these concerns in writing, for an employee to undergo a medical examination by a nominated medical practitioner for an assessment of the employee's fitness for duty if they have concerns after signing or agreeing to sign the health declaration. Right. Now, other, other things that may offer in the workplace is a workplace assessment. Staff have the right to ask for a review of their current work environment, desk situ you know, the desk where they sit, the chairs, if they believe it's not meeting the work health and safety regulations due to pain or discomfort or ill health at all. Now I've worked with one of my colleagues who had, who had cancer in the brain and had um, limited sight. So we of course ensured when she started, she put it on a health declaration, I was quite aware of it as HR manager in the area, to ensure that she had a work health and safety assessment of her desk area. So we of course got her a chair that was suitable for her due to pain that she'd had in her spine. We ensured that her computer was um, readable for her, so if we up the font or change the size of the computer, we certainly can do that in the screen and making sure that she had everything around her that she needed and that works quite well. Now also in the case of coming back to work, if you've had um, a diagnosis of cancer and you've had treatment with cancer in any way at all, 
A rehabilitation case manager, if a staff is, should be nominated to each staff, if a staff member has been away from work due to ill health for a period of usually greater than about 10, 10 working days. A rehab case manager should be allocated to ensure a safe and acceptable return to work for that staff member. HR should be contacted to set up this meeting and arrange for this to be done. There's also working from home arrangements. Work from home can usually be arranged for a staff member if they are finding it difficult to return to the workplace. As long as there's a plan in place, as long as there's a plan is put in place um, and, there's an, and it's agreed with their manager and the agency head. However, not all, all staff members will need to be cleared medically before they can be expected to work from home. So if you have been off with treatment or surgery related to your um, illness, then as long as you're cleared to come back from work and your work is agreed, you might be able to do some work from home because that might help with um, tiredness and fatigue and sitting at a desk all day or actually getting into work because of disability or unable to get um, in with a wheelchair or unable to actually get in and out of the office because it's sometimes a little bit hard with transport. So these arrangements is for the benefit of the staff member and of course the organisation. Now there's an, usually most agencies have a, a, an employee's assistance program. This service is available for all public sector employees and should be nominated in their, either their certified agreement or their workplace agreement or their enterprise agreement at no cost to the staff member. Usually the employee's assistant program arrangement is, a nomina is nominated three or four sessions annually for each staff or their f and or their family depending on check your current agreement. So you should get three, free se three to four three sessions a, a year. So that's sometimes someone to talk to or discuss with if anything needs to happen. So you can talk to them. Um, if anyone else wants to talk about anything, you know, please log some questions up. Happy to discuss those those um, issues at all. But can I please say your HR manager should be your first one of your first points of contact when you come back to work. Um, your manager, talk to them when you return to work. Tell them you should have a brief explanation of why you're going off, off sick, why, how you've been when you've come back. Sometimes you've got to take a bit of initiative. I know you're tired and I know you've been through an awful um, illness and you've been quite ill, but if you need someone on your side, Hopefully your HR manager will be someone who will be on your side and can assist you with the process and assist you through the maze of returning to work and trying to work out how you can come back to work, how you can sit in there comfortably, looking at your um, working relationship with your manager and your colleagues. Your rehabilitation manager should become your best friend. They can certainly arrange with whether it's with Cancer Australia or whether it's with your local medical support to come and give sometimes um, a short little lunchtime seminar to colleagues around the feelings of people coming back to work who've had a long illness or a cancer related illness. So they can come and give a seminar so people understand it. It's a hard question when people come back to ask more so just how are you or are you feeling well, are you not feeling well. Sometimes people are too scared to ask you, they don't want to know the answer, they don't know how to ask you. So if you become good friends with your HR manager they often can assist they can help run seminars, they can help do a little education and training seminar within your local area, within your team, see how you go. So that's, I suppose that's a little bit from me from HR but if you have any questions please um, post them up, happy to answer them, happy to assist you in any way that I possibly can. Thank you very much and I wish you all very well. I'll Thanks you back Joanne. To and now um, we've got the polling question up on the screen. Um, has Joanne given you some new ideas of what you can do when facing problems at work? So the poll will come up now and please participate. Great. Thank you everyone. So now we're going to move on to questions. So we had many questions um, that people posed when they registered um, and, we, and we picked out um, a few of the most, as I said, most common. So the first one um, Joanne's going to actually address and the question is when returning to work to a new role created for me, can my salary be decreased is the first part of the question and whilst receiving 100% income protection should my employer have continued to contribute to my superannuation? 
So over to you on that one, Joanne. Thanks very much, Jill. So when you're turning to work in a new, that a new role is being created for you, that's good, I hope. I hope the role suits your needs. Um, your salary can be, can your salary be decreased? It, it's all salary should be discussed when you come back about if they're going to change your role. So if you started at a certain level, you went off on your illness, you came back and they've decreased your salary. In the public sector, as I said, no, they can't do that. They have to negotiate with you. They have to work out what level you'll come back at. They have to at least give you three to six months to try the role that you're in. Then if it's not working and you find for some reason your mental capacity can't manage the role that you were in previously, then you may need to be decreased a role and decrease your salary. Um, whilst receiving 100% income protection, should my employer have continued to contribute my superannuation? Now in the public sector, again, I'll caveat that by. Income protection, I'm assuming this means by a income protection insurance that you had privately, which doesn't have anything to do with the, um, the public sector um, employment area. If you're on some superannuation schemes, some of them are some of the um, Commonwealth and state superannuation schemes, the defined benefit schemes will continue your superannuation deductions. Some of the newer schemes now today don't, don't have superannuation deductions included on when you're on leave without pay. So you actually have to talk to your HR manager or your payroll manager about those, those issues. But if you're on income protection, which is separate to your work-related um, uh, sick leave or your annual leave deductions, then those have to be negotiated with your um, work area. So Jill, I'll hand it on back. Thanks for that, Joanne. Uh, the next question that we've had is, what are my rights in relation to negotiating different work duties and fewer working hours when my employer expects me to perform my usual role and work more hours than I can cope with. And I think that harks back to um, Luke's story at the beginning there. So Joanne, I think you are going to talk about that one too? Yes, I am, Sarah. Thanks. So negotiating different work duties is a good idea when you come back. See how you go, see how you feel, see what your um, level of fatigue is like or your mental capacity when you come back. Sometimes you're a little bit you're more fatigued, your memory might not be as good because you've had a lot of treatment. Um, you have to work that out. If you want to work different hours, if you want to actually change your working hours, then you really do need to support yourself and your argument is a medical certificate. So you need medical clearance to come back to work from your health practitioner, whether it's your oncologist, your haematologist or your GP. You need someone to write your medical certificate and say you can come back to full-time work or you can come back to part-time work or three days a week or whatever you, that suits you for your health issues. Um, and it will usually say part-time work at usual duties or something along those lines. So you actually have to have that clear and it has to be documented and put on your personnel file. And you have to discuss that with your manager. But if you could please try and keep your HR manager on side to try and support you because they're your advocate in the agency hopefully fingers crossed, that they will support you and be with you at a meeting. If you are having difficulties with that, your um, health practitioner won't be able to come to meetings with you, but maybe your oncology nurse might be able to, or your support agency at all might, be able to ha might have someone who can come and sit with you and support your argument to come back to work. Great. Thanks, okay, Joanne. Thanks. Thank you. The next question was one that came up before the webinar, but also was raised in the chat box as well. When does the Disability Discrimination Act cease to apply for someone that has received a cancer diagnosis or completed treatment? And Sarah White, you are going to speak to that please? Yeah. Um, basically the Dis Disability Discrimination Act never ceases to apply. If someone is going to take action against you because of that reason, you'll always be afforded that protection. Um, obviously from a practical standpoint, as time goes on, um, unless you um, disclose it to a future employer or something like that, um, then it will be more difficult to draw the connection um, to the reason um, being as a consequence of your um, cancer diagnosis. Um, so it never, never ceases to apply as such. Um, as I said before, an employer is required to make reasonable adjustments. So those um, sorts of things apply in relation to returning to work once you've completed treatment, unless it would cause the employer um, unjustifiable hardship. Uh, 
Okay. We... Hi, thanks, Sarah. Are we back? Okay. And I think uh, going on from that discrimination topic, uh, people were wondering what legal options do I have if I'm suffering from discrimination by my employer because of my health issues? Yes. Yeah, so the the most common um, sort of claim that um, we will generally assist with is either a disability discrimination complaint or a general protection um, claim. Um, now, there are advantages to both. Both are relatively informal um, environments to start with, at least. So usually there is a face-to-face um, -face, um, conciliation conference or similar to a mediation um, for all of those types of claims where you have an opportunity to go before um, a third party to assist you to resolve the issue. Um, now, it, once you raise, um, the reason why general protections is most popular is because the onus of proof shifts to the employer as soon as you allege that they're taking some form of action against you because of um, your disability. So as soon as you essentially raise that, um, as long as you've got something to draw that link, it's up to the employer to have to show that whatever they're doing isn't because of that reason. Um, so yeah, generally a, a general protections claim or um, discrimination complaint. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And another question that I know we get asked a lot at Cancer Council is, Am I legally bound to tell my current or future employer about my cancer diagnosis or treatment? Sarah, are you happy to, to field that one? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, there's no legal requirement for you to disclose this to your current or future employer. Obviously, um, the current employer, if you're requiring time off work, you must provide them with sufficient evidence um, that you're suffering from a medical condition. From a practical standpoint, the with most employers, the more information um, they have, the better the HR manager can assist you. Um, but there's no legal obligation for you to do that um, unless the employer asks you um, either during your employment or on commencement to declare any relevant um, or any medical conditions. Some employers will also send you for a pre-employment medical um, where certain questions may be asked and any answer to that um, which you don't answer truthfully um, and the employer subsequently finds out can be um, um, sort of held against you um, in the future if it does become an issue. Um, so there's no legal obligation unless you, um, you are asked to sign um, some form of declaration or to disclose that to your employer. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Now, I've got a question that's come through the chat box and I think it might be a good um, one for Joanne. Joanne, you talked about people being able to potentially um, negotiate working from home post-treatment. Um, someone asked a question that would well, let us know, sorry, that their previous employer refused any work at home on the advice of the HR department where she worked or um, and that was because of WH and S issues allegedly. Is that is that something that comes up, Joanne? Yes, it does actually. It does come up sometimes. I think what you need to do is check your agency's um, work from home policy. Um, I know we have a very good strong one. We actually have three clients, three customers at the moment who work from home in my Commonwealth agency, and that happens a lot around the Commonwealth that I work. Um, but you must have it. They must, of course, have a work at home assessment. So they must ensure that everything's available and it's okay. You can't work at home if you're medically ill. If the doctor has put you off on sick leave, that's not work from home. If the doctor has cleared you for work and has recommended you that maybe you have a day or two at home, I'm not saying full time at home. Sometimes there's rules around working from home and ensuring that you keep in contact with the workplace. So have a look at what your policy is in your workplace. I'm sure they've either got it on the internet or they have a book of policies or wherever they have those um, and see what the the uh, regulations are around that. Uh, depends on your agency, depends how lenient they are. So, um, a lot of agencies also are able to access grants, common, there's Commonwealth and state grants to assist people to work from home. So for example, they can set up their computer desk at home or you know, they can ensure that they get a chair or um, facilities are fine at home so that, that, that they are a safe 
and sometimes they just need to do a couple of days at home, a couple of days a week, which helps out them, so just takes the stress off them coming to the office. But please check your policy in your workplace. Great. Thanks, Joanne. Another question that's come through the chat box is about unions, so wanting to know what is the position of unions on cancer and returning to work post-treatment? Um, are unions equipped to provide support and advocate for people in this situation? Sarah, are you happy to comment on that? Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. Um, unions, if you are a member of a union, um, can often be um, your strongest advocate um, with when these sorts of issues arise that we're talking about. Um, they can assist you um, generally just by paying your membership fees to advise you about what your legal entitlements are based on um, your, the position that you're faced with. Um, obviously it would depend on which union um, um, you're a member of, but generally um, unions are all over the sorts of um, claims that you can make um, and will provide a very, very strong advocacy service and also a referral service um, which may um, mean that you don't actually have to pay anything to um, get legal advice similar to the Cancer Council's um, referral service um, to act for you in relation to issues that arise. Um, and some unions, depending on their membership um, requirements, if you're not a member, but something happens to you at work, some unions will actually um, agree to provide you with advice and act on your behalf if you agree to pay um, you know, a year's membership fee up front, which is, um, can be a lot cheaper than um, getting legal advice. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, do, we, do we think we have time for one more quick question? Um, people have asked about what would happen if they work in a small workplace with no HR managers and rehab people, that kind of thing. What's their best recourse there? Do you want me to take that one, Sarah? Uh, I'm happy to you, okay. if you like. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, I know some, some areas mightn't have HR managers and I know sometimes HR managers aren't the most helpful. I feel sorry for you if you have that. Come and work in my place. I'll help you. <laughs> um, what I'd say is maybe go to your employee's assistance program one available to you. I'd use your, if your rehab manager is helpful, that's also a point of contact. Or your, maybe your oncology nurse, and you might get assistance there. Or a cancer service that you have in your local area might have assistance who can come and sit with you and talk with your manager about um, the situation or whatever is happening about either work from home or um, getting a desk assessment around your workstation or your return to work duties or your hours of work. Um, you, have, you should really try and have someone with you to be your advocate I think would be um, a good, my, my best advice if you don't actually have a good HR manager or any HR managers at all. I might just add on from that as well Joanne. Um, quite often we get referrals through um, social workers that um, work at the hospitals and um, often have good relationships with referral service um, providers and um, can really put you in touch um, a lot of the employers that come through, um, that we see through referral services um, are unfortunately smaller employers who aren't necessarily wanting to do the wrong thing but don't actually know what the right thing is. Um, so sometimes it's just about speaking out um, to see if someone can put you in touch um, with um, the right people to help out. Thanks so much for that, Sarah and Joanne and Luke on the line as well. Um, it was great to answer all those questions and to hear from everyone. Um, so I guess just to, to wrap up, you know, there's a, a lot of legislation and law that exists to protect your employment. There is access to advice both within your workplace but then also externally. Um, so yeah, your workplace might have services that you can access but also you can seek, seek the help of external advocates um, and lawyers who can help you. Uh, so I'd just like to thank everyone for being part of the webinar today and, and I think it went really well. Thank you everyone and um, once again the Cancer Council Information and Support Line can help you if you have any queries and um, you call 13 11 20 is the number and as I mentioned earlier Lifeline is available 24 7 if you feel you need to speak to someone if some of these issues we've talked talk today may have distressed you at all on 13 11 14. I'd just like to remind you we have an exit survey so we would love you to complete that to help us make our webinars 
more interesting and better as we go on in time. And the recorded webinar will be available on our website in a couple of days' time. And everybody that's registered will get an email with the link to make it very easy to find. And please share that amongst your friends if you have other people that you know that may be interested. So thank you, Joanne, Sarah, and Luke, and Sarah, for being on the mm -hmm. webinar tonight. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it and um, gained some new information. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.